Good day everyone. What a wonderful opportunity of being together again. Now, today is the sort of the last time that we're going to touch on the 40 days of community and all that we've learned about community as a church and reaching the community where we live. But we're also going to begin with the next short mini-series that we have of three weeks by studying John 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer. I would like to invite you, but before we do that, let's pray together. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we want to glorify your name and thank you for your love and your grace and your kindness. For the fact that you have chosen us to be your children, that you have given us the opportunity of being part of your church, that you have given us your word in our language, that you have given us the Holy Spirit to guide us, to understand it. Uh, that you remind us through your word, through your spirit, through the church, about all the things that you've taught us. Thank you that we may be so privileged. And that today we can begin with this wonderful prayer that you can teach us again. And we pray that you will really enlighten our hearts, that you will make us um, aware of not only your presence, but of how true your word is, and of how important it is for us to to live by the word, to understand what it says, and to believe and obey it. We pray for your, for your um, grace as we listen, and that you will really teach us and help us in the name of Jesus. Amen. So the, the beginning of this series, we're going to look at how Jesus is praying for his disciples. And I'm going to call it Jesus' all-encompassing prayer. Now I would like to, you to read with me from the Bible. I'm going to begin with the last few verses of chapter 16 going into chapter 17. And we should remember that Jesus had this wonderful last lunch or last supper with his disciples where he washed their feet and where he taught them a lot of last important messages about um, him going away and them receiving the Holy Spirit. And then just before they left to Gethsemane and after that, of course, the cross, he, um, he prays for them. He prays for them specifically when he looks up into heaven and we read the following from chapter 31, sorry, from chapter 16, verse 31. Jesus answered them, Do you believe now? The time is coming, and it is already here, when all of you will be scattered, each of you to your own home, and I will be left alone. But I'm not really alone, because the Father is with me. I've told you this, so that you will have peace by being united to me. The world will make you suffer, but be brave. I have defeated the world. Isn't it wonderful? And then we read, after, that is now from chapter 17, after Jesus finished saying this, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your Son, so that the Son may give glory to you. For you gave him authority over all people, so that he might give eternal life to all those you gave him. And eternal life means to know you, the only true God, and to know Jesus Christ, whom you sent. I have shown your glory on earth. I have finished the work you gave me to you have you gave me to do, sorry. Father, give me glory in your presence now. The same glory I had with you before the world was made. You can go back and read that again. But today we're going to look at this, how Jesus began his prayer. But before we carry on with John 17, we must remember that Jesus came to this world to seek and save who was lost. Now we must not think. We must, shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that when Jesus left with his ascension, to sit at the right hand of the Father, that his work on earth stopped, that he did not carry on with his work. 
he is still busy with it. But not in the body that he had, that he received from God through birth at that day in Bethlehem. No. Now it's a new body through whom he work on earth. And that is his church. But his work is carrying on. And that is what we have learned these last 40 to 50 days, that we are still engaged in God's work on earth. And we should be prepared and prepare ourselves to join God in, in building His kingdom. But we need His guidance and His assistance. And that is what he prayed for in John 17. And that's why we're going to spend time the next three weeks to learn from what we can learn from Jesus. How he interceded for his disciples because he knew they're going to have hard times and he knew he would not be with them in the flesh anymore, but through the Spirit. And therefore he prays for them. And because that is the scenario of this prayer. We as a church call it the high priestly prayer. The high priestly prayer because Jesus intercedes for his church on earth, for his disciples. And it is divided in three sections. The first smaller section that we've read now is how Jesus prayed for himself. And we will explain what that means. And then next week, we're going to look at how Jesus prayed for his disciples. And in two weeks' time, we're going to see how Jesus concludes this prayer by praying for those who will be brought to Jesus by his disciples. We're not going to have, we won't really have time to, to do this chapter um, in so much detail that you will know everything. But we have compiled Bible studies. And we want to encourage you to get those little books and do the study on your own. Because each sermon can only sort of cover one or two aspects of what we would like to do that day. But if you do that study the next few weeks, you will really learn much more from Jesus' high priestly prayer. Now when Jesus begins with this prayer, he begins with a rather important statement. Jesus Begin praying by saying, Father, the time has come. And with this, Jesus is announcing that there is a turning point coming in the history of this world. Now we know what he meant. Because there was never before that and never there will be again a situation where a God comes and sacrifices for his people. All religions always um, means that the people should sacrifice for their gods. But Jesus said, the time has come that he as God and King will sacrifice himself so that his people can be saved. And that is why Jesus asked the Lord to give him the glory back that he had. Jesus when he came to this earth, has, um, has given up the glory that he had as being God. He stayed God, but he had to adapt to being a human as well. And now he asked his father, Re return my former glory, please. But it's not on behalf of himself. He's actually praying that so that God can be glorified through that, because that is the turning point that he's talking about. He is going to sacrifice himself now, but that will give God all the glory. And then he's going back to his father to be in the position that he was before. And that is what he's praying for, that God will bless all of this and that God would use all of this so that God alone will be glorified. And that is what Jesus is reminding us through this prayer, that when we pray, we should always seek God's glory. That is what he also taught us when he taught us the Our Father prayer. We should always pray for God's glory. Now when we have done this study of the 40 days, we have learned how important it is 
that the church will also portray God's glory and his love to the world around us. Now the question is, how can we um, sort of use this chapter 17 of John to help us with this? Now in the first place, we see that Jesus assures us that he will not leave us on our own in this world. He is going away and his disciples is going to stay behind in a cruel world and therefore he's praying for them. His last remark that we've read, the last verse of chapter 16 says, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And then the biggest portion of this prayer is how Jesus prayed for different aspects of the disciples' struggle and the disciples' love and life for him. The second aspect that we learn from this um, prayer and how it's going to help us to carry on with the challenge that we got these last few weeks from um, the series that we've done to go out and reach out is that we must learn to pray more. If Jesus needed it, how much more do we not need to learn and to, to practice prayer? That is the thing that's standing out today, Jesus' um, dependence on praying to his Father. Dependence on his Father, but also dependence on prayer to his Father. He told us it's going to be difficult for Christians in this earth. But then he told us, but you must have peace. Don't be worried. I am praying for you. I have already overcome this world. Jesus looked up to the Father when he started praying. Isn't it wonderful? He respects the Lord so much that he looks up. He knows God is omnipresent, but still he looked up and prays to the Father. He intercedes for his disciples and he prays that the Lord will help and assist them. And that is what, what he teaches us about prayer, is that when we pray, we should not focus on the people around us. We should focus on God. And too many people, actually, when they pray, um, they focus on the people around them. That often hinders people to pray. I found it so much that people don't want to pray in a group because they are afraid of how it will sound. Will they be right? In other words, they are concerned about the people around them. Jesus, when he prayed, he was concerned about God and what God, what he wants to tell God and how he believes God will hear him and listen to him. He prays to the Father in heaven. And that's why we should learn to do that more and more and more. The third thing that this high priestly prayer teaches us and how it's going to help us in the weeks and the months and the years to come is that Jesus says, but it's all about eternal life. Jesus acknowledges here that God gave him the power to give all those that the Lord gave to him eternal life. And now we pray that God will glorify him because people receive eternal life. And then he explains what is meant with eternal life. And I think sometimes people do not really realize and they've got their own idea of what everlasting life or eternal life is. Maybe I should use the word everlasting life. And here it says everlasting life is to know God. And to know Jesus, whom God has sent. The word know in the Greek is gnuesku, but it actually means a knowledge through relationship, like the knowledge or yeah, the knowledge that a father 
and a child has of one another. The knowledge between a husband and a wife. It's not academical knowledge. It's not historical knowledge. It is knowledge that they accrued by experiencing life together. Even a teacher and his disciples, like Jesus and his disciples for three years, they had this knowledge that his disciples could call him master and he could call them his friends. This is life experience that bring people closer and closer and closer together. And that is the knowledge that, is, uh, that we need to have eternal life. Or actually, I must put it the other side, other way around. That is what eternal life is, to have such a knowledge of God, a knowledge through experiencing Him as your living God and Savior, a personal knowledge, a relationship knowledge. And that is why we must learn from this prayer, because we have to pray this way. In his first week already, Rick Warren taught us that we need to have this personal knowledge of the Lord and with the Lord before we can reach other people. And a personal relationship, a personal knowledge of the Lord, that begins when someone accepts Jesus as their Savior, accepts the Lord in their life, and begin living with Him daily. And Jesus said, that already begins here on earth. In John, 5, chapter, in John chapter 5, verse 24, He said, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Now I want to ask you the question, do you have eternal life? Do you have eternal life? To answer me, you must actually hear that I'm asking you, do you have a personal relationship with the Lord God and our Savior Jesus? The church are all those people on earth who have such a relationship with Jesus and becomes a family who have communion and community with one another. Now, earlier I said that Rick Warren he wrote this uh, or compiled this series because he wanted the church as a, as a body to reach out with the love of Jesus. And that is why it's so important that we should study this portion again so that we can learn how to do that. But now that we've learned a lot of stuff about community and reaching out to community, before we carry on with John 17, I want to ask you something about the last few weeks. I want to ask you, is there anything that you have learned that is not true? I don't think so. Is there anything that, um, or, or it, did, you, did you not perhaps learn anything at all? Um, I don't think so too. What we know is that we have been exposed to a lot of new knowledge and also a few ideas how to do it about community within and reaching out to community. But now the question is, what are we going to do with that? Are we just going to feel, okay, we've ticked that box, now we carry on? Or, we or are we going to practice what we have learned? You know what? There are quite a few people who have taken the books, but they have not finished all 40 devotions yet, so they have not really received all the information. There are many people who have done perhaps all 40 devotions already, but they didn't really start practicing it. So that is just as much of a pity. And then, of course, 
there are even people who didn't do anything of it. And it's not that they are now behind. What it actually means is that if you're not really doing this, you're not, you're getting loose uh, of the church. You are not, you are not really um, working on community. And that is what I want to encourage you, that God has given us this message for the church as a whole, and we want to encourage you to, to carry on with this and to use the time that you have ahead to catch up with what you missed out. We must learn how to be serious about community. And I want to try to explain what I mean with that. In the first week, um, the, book, the, the series taught us how to be serious about loving one another. Now, you have done that. But what does it help if you have done that, but you at this stage are avoiding people because you cannot really stand them. That is not the love that he is talking about. The second week, he taught us how we should intentionally reach out to people who are not part of the church, not part of the kingdom. But how are we going to do that if we only make contact with our small group and with no other people? You see what I mean? We need to learn to practice what we have learned. In the third week, we have learned how important it is that we have this family, that we need this community of believers. But then in day 16, we've learned how that we should commit, that we should pitch up. How do you, how can we uh, really do that, that we have learned, if you only come to church uh, often, oh no, if you come intermittently, if, if you've missed um, five or six times in a term, how can you really do that, that you've learned there? So my encouragement is that we should not only see this as academical, academical information that is good to know. What this actually was is an encouragement how we should change our way of thinking about church, how we should change our own personal way of living, because we need to be with each other more, so that the Lord can use us together more. So, to conclude, the 40-day series has been concluded now, but not our challenge to reach out with God's love. The question is, how should we continue? In the first instance, we should continue by having our quiet time with the Lord every day. We should keep on learning from His Word. The book that we used was, was an aid. It was not something in the place of the Bible. The Bible is what is teaching us and we should make time for it every day. The second thing that we should focus on is our small groups. Do not think of, of um, stopping now because we have done the series. Why don't you carry on? Maybe invite another family and do the small series that we've got now and carry on to meet in the presence of the Lord and encourage one another to build your community with God and with each other and also to build your relationship in such a way that you can reach out together. The third focus that we should have is our projects that we've began. I think most of the projects are still in the planning phase. Carry on with that. Don't stop now because the series is finished. Carry on. The Lord has prompted you what to do. Carry on with that. And then the last is maybe the most important. We should pray and pray more and pray more because Jesus is teaching us how to pray. And the reason why we should pray is we have just heard in the beginning of this prayer that everlasting life, eternal life, is to have a living relationship with the living God. 
And the only way that you can really build that relationship is through communication with Him. On the one hand, He talks to you through His Word, but He also speaks to you when you pray. And that, on the other hand, you speak to Him. And in that conversation, that relationship grows. Now that is why we're going to focus on John 17 the next three weeks, so that we can learn more about prayer and about Jesus' will and what he wants for his disciples from his father. Jesus is asking that, that we need. Because we are not much different from the disciples that night when Jesus prayed for them. We are in the same situation. We are in a cruel world and people do not like the Christians. We are going to have it hard, as he said, you must remember that in this life you will suffer. And therefore, we need Jesus' prayer. It is just as important for us in the 21st century as it, is, as it was when Jesus prayed it. And it's just as applicable because we are in much the same situation. Especially for Leeming, there is a future of uncertainty. We do not know um, what place we have to move to. We need the Lord to help us with our funds. And we've got a lot of uncertainty. But the Lord says, do not worry, have peace. I have already overcome this world. And therefore, his prayer is very personal and it applies to us as well and that is why i'm calling you and i want to encourage you take time take these little books it's on the on the internet also if you can't read it in leaming and study john 17 and see how jesus is praying for us what he is praying for and what you and i have to focus on May the Lord bless you in that. Let's pray together. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we want to glorify you and we want to thank you for your love and your kindness. And we want to thank you for your word. But there is another thing that we want to thank you for today, Jesus, and that is your example of prayer and praying. And for that wonderful night when you looked up to heaven and when you prayed for the disciples but in that instance also prayed for us we thank you that you did not leave us on our own that we can always be sure of your intercession for us at the right hand of the father and that we can go to your word and learn not only from your example, but from your own words, what it is that is necessary for us to survive as Christians and to honor you with our lives. We pray help us to be obedient to you and to follow you in the name of Jesus. Amen. May the Lord bless you and may you have a wonderful time. Thank you.